Hi again, everyone. So this is our first time trying to do a, a video lecture. So please give me some feedback on how it turns out for you. I'm happy to um, adjust as we continue working through these in a way that's going to help you all be more effective as we learn it. So a couple things, since this is our first time doing this. I would like to once again remind you that you should be having some sort of notes, whether that is um, online using another monitor, if that's having an old school spiral notebook, which is actually what I highly recommend. What you're going to see as we go through this is I have basically set up a timeline for us. And you can see here starting from the beginning of humanity 200,000 something years ago um, when people showed up on the planet all the way up until the field of psychology is pretty much established. So I'm going to try and quickly go through this timeline. Um, quickly meaning I'm expecting this video to probably take 30 or 40 minutes. So please plan your time accordingly on it. So um, please make sure you're taking notes. Please make sure that you are comparing your notes against what you're hearing from me and the textbook. There are pieces in the textbook. I'm not going to talk about it. There's, pe there's pieces that I'm going to talk about that are not in the book. So again, you're responsible for knowing all of these pieces and being able to integrate those within your mind and your understanding of the field of psychology. What you'll notice from me um, and my take on the history is I've organized it into waves. So you can see we're starting with the pre-scientific foundations of psychology before there's any science. And as you know, how do we define psychology? Hopefully you know this by now, that scientific study should be that core thing that's coming into your mind. So as we are starting to define um, what's, where psychology came from, it's important for us to look before psychology was actually established as a science. And so we go back to the very first person that has ever asked a question about another person. So as far as humanity has existed, people have asked questions about our existence and about other people. So who am I? Why do I have these thoughts? Why do I have these feelings? Are other people like me? Do they do the same things I do? Do they think the same way I do? Do they perceive things the same way I do? Wait, why did that person just go up and run into a tree on purpose? How are, we, how are they doing weird things that I don't understand why they do things? They must think differently than I do. And so we start to see this inc in inquisitive attitude towards people and other people and how we're different. But then we start having some of those people back in our caveman days that were problematic in some sort. Um, maybe they were just weird. Maybe they were actively causing issues in our society. But either way, they cause problems for it. And so we see from prehistoric times, we can see evidence of trepanning. Other sources call this trephination, as a T-R-E-P-H. Um, trephination. And that was one of the earliest ways of dealing with psychological disorders or um, just people being different at times. And so as you can see here from the images, and I know I'm kind of blocking one of them for you, um, they would actually drill, drill holes in people's skulls. And that's what the process of trepanning is. And the goal there is if people are here stuck to the ground, but there's bad spirits, Spirits are lighter than people are. So if we make a hole, then that will allow the spirit to float up and out of my head and get better. And of course, modern common sense would say, or you're going to bleed out, or you're going to end up with a nasty infection, which is most likely what happened in a lot of cases. But we do have evidence that this was an early treatment for, um, for people. So then as we continue to move forward in history, then we get to the Greeks. And the Greeks were the first time that we start to see like organized flows of logic through their, through their philosophical ideas. And they start to have different ideas. So we see Socrates and Plato starting off, which came in and said, we are born with knowledge. And this knowledge is almost a thing unto itself because we're born with it. Um, and that knowledge will then continue well after our death as well. Um, that's the root of, if you've heard of the Socratic method or a Socratic seminar, the goal there is, let's just ask a bunch of questions. Socrates' attitude was, 
you already know it. We just need to pull it out of you as opposed to the modern ideas that we're going to make you think about it and come up with your own conclusions about it. Plato was one of the first people to come up and say the brain is the place where we have our mental processes. So that's where we come into these two. However, Aristotle is where we dwell a little bit more. He is the first one to say our own knowledge is coming from our own memories. Um, and he's going to study a whole lot more that is completely wrong, such as how um, the core of your personality is in your heart. And that's where your mental processes happen also. And he uses logical processes to explain this, like how when you eat a really, really big meal, then you have like your stomach expands and that pushes on your heart, which makes you feel kind of lazy, like you might feel after a big holiday meal. Um, now we know that's completely untrue at this point, but that was the logical process by which he started to organize things. And if we skip ahead another millennia, we end up in the Middle Ages Europe. And at this point, we end up with the very strong influence of religion in the Catholic Church, especially in the Middle Ages. And so at this point, society has fallen back into a very black and white thinking of you think the way I do, or you must have evil in you. Um, so we start to feel the need to treat evil out of people. Um, and in this case, that's where you can start to see, oh, you're, you're acting strange. That must mean that you're possessed or you're a witch. Um, and so you can see a couple of treatments here on the screen of ways to handle that, whether that may be um, burning someone alive or trepanation coming back into existence again. Um, surprising side note, by this point, about 80% of trepanning um, subjects would survive going through this process. But let's get back into when the Renaissance starts and when we start getting into um, the creation of modern ways of thinking. Now this is still pre-science at this point. Science has not been established yet as a topic, but we start to get to guys like this, Rene Descartes who started to ask questions about, I mean, he's most famous for his existential question of, I think, therefore I am. But then he starts to expand from there. So how does my mind communicate with my body? Because clearly I can think, move my arm, and then my arm is going to move. So how is it those start to communicate? And so he was so close. He came up with the theory that we have fluid in our brain that contains little animal spirits that flow through tubes in our bodies. And that's really close. I mean, we do have cerebral spinal fluid that's enclosed, not so much so on the animal spirits, but yet we do have these, these tubes as he would have seen them running through our body. Um, now we just call them nerves. And so we're getting closer into modern foundations and then we focus into the actual creation of science. Um, Francis Bacon is considered one of the fathers of science. Um, he loved looking at the human mind and started, was one of the first organized thinkers into why we find meaning in random events, which we still do that. That's the root of modern superstitions also. Um, but we like to make things more orderly than they really are and assume that there's meaning behind them when there may not be. So he initially starts to work through studying those um, to show you that scientific attitude. Um, Bacon is also famous for getting curious and deciding he's going to run some studies on it. So he started to get curious one day about he was in a carriage and it was snowing outside. Um, and he started thinking about how, hey, if we, we put chickens in salt to help preserve them. So salt's this like white powdery stuff. We're covered in snow. What if we put chicken in snow? Um, would that be able to preserve it also? And so he was so inspired by this new question that he went to the first farm he saw. He went and bought a chicken off of the local farmer, killed it just to pack it in snow to see what would happen. And the results from there have been lost to history. But the idea that he is going through, coming up with ideas, testing them, trying to continue to see how these things play out is such a huge step towards science. Then we get to John Locke, and hopefully you remember a little bit of John Locke from your world history class. 
and your government class. And so there's a lot of historical contributions. He's huge in government, but we're not focused on that. We are focused more on his concept of empiricism. And empiricism is the foundation, the foundational belief of modern science that says knowledge must come from experience and observation. So what that means is if we want to understand our world and build knowledge about this understanding, we have to actually have measurable ways to experience it and observe it. So this is where experimentation comes from. You go to a science class and you run an experiment and you say over and over again, hey, I observe when the thermometer hits 100 degrees Celsius, the water's boiling. And I observe when the water's at zero degrees Celsius, the water's freezing. And so we can test that over and over again and have a shared experience of that, um, which will now develop knowledge of how these things work. Um, he is also going to be one of the early advocates of what we call the blank slate or known in Latin as tabula rasa. So this concept is that we're going against all of these prior people that said you're born with knowledge. And he's gonna come in and say, no, you're just there and your experience will write onto you and make you become who you're going to be. And this is a huge revolution because in the historical context of everything, John Locke is essentially saying the old order of you're a noble and therefore you have the, the blood right to rule might not be right. Maybe we could take a farmer and train him to be a king and he could do just as well. And so this is a brand new idea that starts to cause a lot of rifts in society, much more so than just psychology. But from that psychological side, we can use our experiences to shape who we're going to become. So, and now of course the root of science comes into, let's ask lots of questions like Francis Bacon and let's make sure we can study those and study those empirically, um, meaning that we have lots of knowledge from experience and observation. As we keep going through history, we end up with phrenology as just another step along the way to try to explain behaviors and mental processes. And I want you to take a second and just feel your head, literally feel your head. And what you're gonna notice is your head is not perfectly smooth. You're having some spots that have little bumps. You have some spots that have slight indentations. And phrenology basically assigned meaning to those. So phrenology says, oh, if you have a bump in a certain spot, that means you're very empathetic. But if you have like a dent in that same spot, that means you don't have any empathy. And you would actually see this becoming more of a widespread phenomenon where people would essentially give what we would call a personality test or a personality assessment based on bumps on your head. Now, just to clarify, in case there's any doubt, there's no science to this at all. Um, those are just how the bones have formed as your skull has fused into one bone from being several as an infant. Um, so no science at all. But again, this idea of, hey, let's test something and let's come up with some theories. As we start pushing through the 1800s, we start to see a, a more compassionate idea towards um, people that have what we now refer to as psychological disorders. Um, so we look at Dorothea Dix, and I believe this is outside of your textbook also. Um, Dorothea Dix was um, very active among that civil war time in trying to say, hey, let's, let's actually make places where mentally ill can go and be taken care of. Rather than being shunned by society, Let's create these places. And this is where the word asylum starts to become a big part of it. Um, she pressured lawmakers to build these and fund them and continue to provide money for them so that she could have safe homes where mentally ill people could continue to live um, and live humanely and be treated like a person. As time goes on, the idea of an asylum is gonna be much less of that humane treatment and much more of um, what you probably imagine with that word on a place where they can be removed from society, but not necessarily taken care of well. And that's an unfortunate downside as you see some of the activism go away until we see that kind of reborn within our past century. <clears throat> 
Then we get into the first founder of one of our major approaches. Charles Darwin comes up with the concept of evolution and natural selection. Um, so in terms of the timeline, you should just note, hey, this is where evolutionary approach to psychology starts to come in. We're going to deal and have a whole video on evolution and what that means in relation to psychology. So we're not going to dwell anymore on that one. And I'm sorry, I forgot to change my slide as I kept going. Um, so here's Dorothea Dix, if you're looking for a spelling to match up with your notes, um, as well as Charles Darwin. So as we keep going, now we get to the official creation of psychological science. And it all starts with Wilhelm Wundt, who you can see an image of him in his lab here as it's described in your textbook. Um, he wanted to really try to break down mental processes versus perceptions. And so he's using a laboratory equipment to essentially um, ask about people's sensations and people's perceptions and how those might be different um, between if you heard the ball hit a platform and that conscious awareness of when you're getting it. Um, the real key here is he's using distinct empirical measures in a scientific laboratory to start studying human mental processes. And so he gets a lot of that credit for that. Um, he's often called the father of psychology. That title is sometimes also attributed to Sigmund Freud, who is going to make it a little bit more well known. Um, but it's actually Wilhelm Wundt who creates the term psychology um, in his first book. He is also going to be the kind of patriarch in a way, whereas a lot of the other people we're going to be talking about were students of his or students of his students. And so he is our major turning point. We're still not officially going into fully scientific study yet, but we're getting there. The next step you can see pretty close in our timeline gets into Edward Titchener. And once we see Edward Titchener as a student of Wilhelm Wundt, um, creates the idea of structuralism. And again, this is easier to remember when we consider that um, no place is in isolation from another. So when we talk about structuralism, this is in the context of people are starting to study chemistry and physics. And if we really focus on chemistry, the, the core idea of chemistry at the time is we can take all these different things in our world and break them down into these tiny little elements. So surely we can do that with the human experience also. And so Structuralism is trying to take the human experience at its smallest little concepts and it uses this process that he calls introspection. And so through introspection, we're having, a self, we're having ourselves look into our mind and then report on our thoughts. So if you grab something that hopefully you all have nearby, let's say something like a pencil. If you take this pencil and start to study it, what are the thoughts that you're having about this pencil? And go ahead and say them out loud. you're probably initially gonna talk about how it looks, the concept of the color and how that color experiences. Have you considered how it feels? What your experience is like if you smell it, if you bite it? What are all of your little experiences with this simple thing? And in doing so, you're looking into your mind, you're reporting the thoughts, you're reporting your experiences. And his goal is to really look at how all these different things are gonna to relate to each other. Now, historically, this, this is great theoretically. We can make psychology look a lot like chemistry, but then we have this problem that people are not very good at reporting their actual experiences. There's a lot of modern research that's gonna say, you know, we're just not good at this. Um, we're wrong about the things that we're thinking sometimes. We don't have the vocabulary to necessarily report the same experience. And so even if you're gonna say that we are experiencing this color the same way, we still might describe it in different ways. So does that mean our experience is different or does that just mean that our vocabulary is different? So there's a whole lot of issues with this idea. Um, and then we get to the core argument against it of William James and we'll see him next. But I'm going to assume at this point, most of you have a driver's license or at least working towards one. And so you probably know how to, how to get a car around. 
But if I forced you to tell me how, when you push the pedal, how does that make the car go? Can you explain that to me? And in doing this in person long enough, there's usually one who can, and we'll talk about how, well, that adds fuel and the fuel mixes with the air and then it combusts, which pushes on a piston, which now is gonna turn a gear. Most of what I probably just said there is completely foreign to most of you. What you know is if I push on the gas, the car is gonna rev up and the car is gonna go. If I push on the brake, the car is gonna stop. And so the core criticism of what we're doing here is, do you really need to know how every little piece of the human brain works? Is this even an important thing to study? And so if it's not that important to study, maybe we shouldn't dwell as much on it. And so that was a very short-lived window of time and it's actually gonna get replaced as William James comes along and creates this idea of functionalism. Functionalism is basically coming in and saying, hey, I push the, car, the, push the gas, the car goes. Why do I need to know? I can take it to a mechanic. The mechanic can figure it out if the gas doesn't go or if the car doesn't go when I push the gas. The mechanic can know how that all works, but I don't need to to understand how to drive the car. And so now we're dealing with the same thing on the brain. We don't need to know all these different little pieces. We don't need to break everything down. We need to look at why do we do what we do. And so we're going to see functionalism looking at what is the evolutionary function of this behavior or this mental process? Why do we do this? How does this help us? So when we look at Edward Titchener, who's going to come in and say, oh, well, we experience this pencil as a slightly yellowish orange color. William James is going to come in and say, why is it important that we see color at all? And so let's start to look into maybe the survival advantage of having color rather than understanding all those little pieces that lead to it. Why, it is, why is it important that we can distinguish colors from one another? Um, William James is also credited with writing the very first psychology textbook. And um, so just add that into your list along the way. So um, one last example before we move on past William James. Um, the core idea here is the function of things. So this is where we start to deal into um, the function of taste, for example. It, you could taste a pencil and you could describe what that tastes like, but that really doesn't provide any valuable information. From a functionalist view, if we look at taste buds, those are there to help us survive. And we'll deal more with that in my evolutionary video also. But essentially, if I taste something and it tastes really bad, we've, been, we've evolved to know that might be poison. Maybe I shouldn't eat that. If I take, taste something that tastes really good, it's more likely to be salt, which I need to be able to keep my nervous, nervous system functioning, or sweetness, which would add a lot more calories to my diet and make it more likely that I will have energy to continue on through daily tasks of life. So as we keep going, now we are officially into the American branch of psychology. Um, so G. Stanley Hall becomes the first president of the American Psychological Association. This is the same American Psychological Association that is going on today and um, still governing a lot of rules on psychological studies. Um, so now we're officially bringing this into the United States and um, creating a formal organization to support it. Now that psychology is becoming more of a thing, we end up with our second wave. So everything up until this has been essentially establishing psychology as a scientific field. And then Sigmund Freud comes along and creates the idea of psychoanalysis. And again, we're gonna have a whole video on this, probably several by the time we're done. Um, he basically comes in and says, as a medical doctor, there's things that are happening that are not clearly explained by medical causes. So there must be something going on under the surface. And so that's where we come up with the idea of the unconscious. And so basically at this point in studying history, we go from let's study all the elements and the function of human behaviors into how do we, how can, else can we explain it using unconscious processes? The reason why Freud is often considered one of the fathers of psychology also is his book, um, which he called The Interpretation of Dreams, 
was one of these first books to go very widely. It just become extremely popular. And so a lot of people started using his ideas and studying his ideas to be able to work through that. Um, he's not as scientifically valid today for reasons that we'll discuss quite a bit later. So as we keep growing, less so much wave two as an extension of wave one with Mary Winton Calkins. Um, she started under William James and was described fairly well in the textbook, I think. Um, you should know that um, she will become the first female president of the American Psychological Association. Um, she's the one you read about that did all the work to earn a PhD, but then was not allowed to actually be awarded that degree at Harvard because she was female. Um, and so we do, we've seen that flip. There's um, the majority of psychology degrees now are awarded to women. So she was the first one to, to start pushing the female um, voice into psychology and leadership um, by becoming that president in 1905. Then we get into gestalt psychology as wave three. And once again, we're starting to look at functionalism. And it looks like my GIF is not working on the screen for you. So what I want you to consider for a second, since you can't see this, is any time that you have seen a light that moves. Um, and if you know anything about lights that move, think of Christmas lights. This one's supposed to kind of take you from one end and swing and come back to the other. Um, they just flash and they're there to give the illusion of movement. And this is where Max Wertheimer came in and said, there's more to the human experience than its small parts, like structuralism says, and there's more than its basic function. The human experience is not about parts and function. If you start to think about the, the love you have for your parents, um, you could talk about, well, let's talk about all the different tiny little pieces of what your parents do. Or we can talk about the evolutionary function of why you need parents. But yet you also have this experience with them and this love for parents that isn't really structural and the functionalism side might get a little bit harder but yet it's still a core part of the human experience is these relationships we have with each other so gestalt psychology is really focused on the entire human experience and studying this entire human experience without worrying so much about the smaller parts of it um, it's not as influential except for one unit. We will look at a lot of gestalt principles in one in our sensation and perception unit. Um, but at this point, it's just another wave to get us thinking about psychology and the human experience in a different way. So then we get to wave four. And again, I'm going to go very quickly through this because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about behaviorism, um, both in an upcoming video as well as we have an entire chapter about it later on. Um, basically, this is an opposition to now Max Wertheimer starts talking about, oh, we have human experiences. And Sigmund Freud is talking about the unconscious mind. And here you have all the other fields of science moving forward scientifically. The behaviorists come in and say, we got to get rid of all this fluffy stuff. If you want to be taken, taken seriously as a science, you have to go empirical. And going empirical means you have to get rid of anything that is not explicitly measurable. And so with behaviorism, we focus in on only things that we can measure. So um, we go into Ivan Pavlov, who was a Russian scientist who started to realize that, um, hey, dogs will salivate even with no food because they have seemingly learned to know when food is coming. John Watson will spend a lot of time talking about later on. Um, he will be in, a, a later president of the American Psychological Association. And when he is, he'll actually redefine psychology just as the scientific study of behaviors, um, trying to eliminate that and make it taken seriously as a field of science. B.F. Skinner, again, we'll talk about him extensively later on, um, did a lot of research on make, manipulating behaviors. Um, and we see him doing a lot with pigeons, but we'll talk about extensions into humans and how he can manipulate human behavior also. Um, so once again, it's this, this pendulum back and forth of what should we focus on? And that's an answer that still isn't fully answered, but it explains a little bit why we have so many different approaches to psychology still today. As psychology continues growing, we have two more influential figures that you're supposed to know. Um, 
the little stars, if you haven't noticed those yet, are generally there to say they don't really come up in our curriculum again. These are just historical accomplishments that the College Board expects you to be able to identify. Um, so in 1921, Margaret Floyd Washburn earned the first, was awarded the first PhD in psychology. And now, again, this is in contrast to Mary Calkins, who earned it but was never awarded the degree. Um, she is now they've reached the point by 1921 that she's actually being awarded the degree. Um, 1933, Beverly Prosser was the first African American woman to receive a PhD in psychology. So again, looking at these these steps forward as psychology tries to um, move forward and be more accepting as time has continued to go on. Then we look at modern psychology. Modern psychology is much more of this eclectic view, where there's all these different approaches, but yet now we look at it as, as this giant buffet. And as this giant buffet, I can pick and choose things. I can say, well, behaviorism is gonna explain this a little bit better, but maybe this can't be explained by behaviorism, so we need to look into some unconscious roots, or maybe we just need to look at the thinking processes that are there. So wave five is more this eclectic side where we're willing to consider different viewpoints um, and put those all under our, our understanding of people. And so with those, we have a couple more important people. 1936, Jean Piaget creates what will be the cognitive approach, um, where essentially he is studying mental processes and cognitive abilities in children. And this essentially is up until this point, the belief has been that children are little mini adults and their brains work just like ours. They're just not very smart yet. In 1936, as Piaget's research is coming along, they start to realize that, no, children think completely differently. Their thinking processes are not just dumber. They are processing information in a completely different way than adults are. And so that creates the cognitive approach where we start to really analyze thinking and how we think and the impacts of our thoughts on our behaviors and mental processes. As we move a little bit closer in time, we end up with Carl Rogers, who you see pictured here, and Abraham Maslow, who are gonna create the humanistic approach. And this is much more focused on um, people reaching their highest potential. And so we are going to see a lot of therapy that's gonna focus on um, providing unconditional positive regard to our clients and focusing on their needs and overcoming obstacles. And again, I'm not gonna dwell as much on this because we'll have a whole other video on the humanistic approach as we keep going. So this closes up our timeline of psychology's history. I would like you to just consider these review questions as we go through this. Um, who is considered the ultimate founder of psychology in 1879 and what made that so significant. And then consider what makes structuralism, functionalism, and behaviorism so different from each other. And what about the historical context by which those formed? So I will leave you with that for just a few minutes so you can process those. Feel free to write down those questions and respond to them accordingly. Thank you for paying, paying attention. I know this was a, a long video, but there's a lot of historical processes that have gone through to creating psychology in the field that it is today. So thank you, I hope to see you soon.